the story of the Wright brothers of Wilbur and Orville was very well known. There was this guy named Charlie Taylor, kind of in the background, who was the Wright brothers mechanic. People still don't know a lot about him. He was what they called a mechanician in the day. He was a genius model maker of uh, his own ilk. He's the first airplane mechanic, really. Charlie built the engine that was on the Wright Brothers 1903 airplane. Telegram from Kitty Hawk had a special significance for the mechanic who worked in the Wright's bicycle shop, Charlie Taylor. Of course, I was greatly pleased to know what had been accomplished, but at that time, it didn't seem to be anything wonderful at, at that. He was born in 1868. He didn't come from an affluent family. Probably not a lot of education, definitely not higher education. He was a, a hog farmer in Indiana. He taught himself the rudimentary mechanical skills needed by a farmer. He came to Dayton because his wife's family was in Dayton. He worked for a couple of smaller manufacturing places and decided to start his own machine shop. The Wright brothers rented a building for a cycle shop from a relative of his wife's. So that's how he got to know them. He got tired of running his own shop and the Wright brothers hired him. Charlie became an employee of the Wright Cycle Company. He could make things, he could use things, he could adapt things. He was Mr. Fix-It, I guess you could say. He took on any task, no matter what was required of him. He became a close friend to them. The Wright brothers financed all of their aeronautical projects from the bike shop. I started on repairing bicycles back in, uh, in the 80s, and then I later went to Dayton and built bicycles. I got acquainted with the Wrights, and I would build bicycles for them. I did all the repair work while they went down Kitty Hawk to try out their gliders. One of the first jobs related to flight that Charlie was assigned was airfoils. How do we get the most lift? A wind tunnel was not a new idea, but the Wrights didn't have one. And so, Charlie, <laughs> you're the guy who can build this stuff. When the brothers came back from Kitty Hawk in 1902, they started researching, how do we make it fly now by itself? We need an engine. It's got to be lightweight. We need this much power. They sent out about uh, 13 tenders saying, can you build an engine of this weight, this uh, RPM, and nobody could do it. Industry was not interested in building one unique engine. They were into mass production. So they uh, turned to Charlie. Charlie said, yeah, I can build one. Charlie helped them figure out what material do we use? I believe it's aluminum because it's lightweight. He constructed the engine all by hand. I made all the different parts in them in the motor. I even made the crankshaft. So I made it out of a solid block of steel, cut it right out of the solid block by drilling holes and knocking out large pieces out of it and then, uh, then turning it up in the lathe. Charlie actually built the engine in six working weeks. Charlie built them an engine that actually gave them more than what they asked for. The story of Wilbur and Orville and Charlie is if they couldn't find it in existence, they built them from scratch. The Wright brothers went to Kitty Hawk in the fall of 1903 to test this airplane with an engine. And it's a complete success, but now they know they've got to come up with something that's going to work in Dayton, Ohio. So in 1904 and 1905, the Wrights are using Huffman Prairie as their local testing ground. Charlie was out at Huffman Prairie a lot. They'd say, Charlie, this is not working right. How do we fix this? What do we change? They have improved the plane so much that in October of 1905, Wilbur takes off with a full tank of gas and he flies around Huffman Prairie. He's got a controllable, sustainable, practical airplane. And the Wright's patent for their control system was not awarded until 06. And so it was after that that they started promoting the airplane and trying to sell it. The U.S. government gets interested and in 1908 signs a contract with the Wright brothers. 
for one heavier than air flying machine. So Wilbur goes to France. He's going to fly in front of the French people for the first time. Orville, in the meantime, is going to demonstrate the plane for the U.S. Army Signal Corps. On one particular flight, he is to take up Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge. Selfridge gets into the plane and they take off and they're flying and one of the propellers splits, hits the guide wire, everything starts to fall apart and they crash. Selfridge dies from his wounds pretty quickly. He's the first military fatality in this country as a result of flying. Charlie was one of the first people to get to the machine. And you can imagine, here's their, their mechanic, their friend, standing there watching this happening. Charlie helped get Orville out of the wreckage and onto the stretcher. And as soon as they took them away, Charlie stood there and just sobbed. Orville eventually recovers and, of course, it feels terrible that this has happened. The U.S. Army Signal Corps understands what happened and they give them an extension. January of 1909, Wilbur flies at Poe. Newspaper men are there, heads of state, crowds from the town. Uh, thousands of people see them fly. The flights at Poe really brought the whole world's attention on the Wright brothers. Because the world had finally seen what they could do, Dayton decided to throw the Wright brothers a huge celebration, complete with parades and speeches at their fairgrounds. As soon as that celebration was over, Wilbur and Orville were on the train to Fort Myer, Virginia because they needed to fulfill the contract. Orville by this time is ready to fly again. Charlie's there and Orville exceeds all of the expectations of that order for the first airplane. Fort Myer is a great success. So they come back to Dayton. They incorporate the Wright Company to manufacture airplanes and they establish the Wright School of Aviation. You've got people coming to the prairie to learn how to fly. Charlie is there to make sure the planes are working correctly. Charlie probably did a lot of teaching. They wanted their pilots to know every inch of that plane and how to fix things if they broke. As the manufacturer of airplanes picked up, Charlie's going back and forth between the factory in Dayton and being out of the flying field. He went to Governor's Island when Wilbur flew around the Statue of Liberty and he helped Wilbur strap a canoe to the bottom of the plane so in case he went into the river, he wouldn't drown. Charlie's there throughout all of this time period. Up until about 1911, Charlie has an opportunity to team up with Cal Rogers, who's decided to go after a Hearst Prize to fly coast to coast. The trip's being sponsored by Vin Fizz, which was a great drink. Cal Rogers learned how to fly at the Wright School of Aviation. So he says to Charlie, I need you as my mechanic. In 1911, Wilbur is fighting the patent suits, traveling to New York City a lot to meet with lawyers. Orville is running the company. Charlie is there working in the, in the factory buildings. Things are changing at the factory. His duties are changing. Personnel is changing. He and some of the other personnel don't get along. Cal Rogers was offering more money than the Wrights were paying him. So he decides, I'll go with Cal Rogers. Cal Rogers was a swashbuckling type. He said, I can do it no matter what kind of a guy. They hired uh, a railroad train. On top of one of the uh, cars of the train was a bullseye. Cal would follow the train and then crash land someplace and Charlie would rebuild it and they would go. Charlie ends up having to leave this adventure because his wife is ill and he has to go home. So he doesn't actually make it to the end of the trip. I think he does make it to California, but he's not there when Rogers lands. He moves his family from Dayton to California. He thinks his wife will do better in the climate. And so Charlie, at that point, kind of drops off the map for a while. He's working in the aviation field at a manufacturing place but he's not in the limelight anymore. And when things started to change, when Wilbur dies of typhoid, Orville's not active in the aviation field after that. Sells the company in 1915. They don't do much after those early years. In the 1930s, he comes back to Dayton to help Orville work with Henry Ford when they actually moved one of the cycle shops to Greenfield Village. Charlie was invited to come and he actually worked for the Henry Ford Museum to tell the story of, of the rights and what had happened and the significance of it. And I think that was probably a really happy time for Charlie. 
He was back with Orville. They were tinkering. They were doing things with their hands. They were doing something they loved. When that ended, Charlie left. He went back to California. Charlie, at the end of his life, is, is very poor. He cannot support himself. He's taken in by another couple. When Orville dies in 1948, Charlie can't come back for the funeral. He's named an honorary pallbearer. He eventually becomes so ill that he passes away in 1956. Charlie's story is kind of sad because not a lot of people remember him by this time. But you think about the amount of time that Charlie lived through. Charlie saw so many changes in aviation and it had to be gratifying to him. Charlie's story is important because he really was the first airplane mechanic. He took on that role without any training, without any formal education for it. Charlie was the first person to develop this as a skill set. He was just a, a genius. Very few people know about him. Where else could you find a story about a guy who runs a pig farm and then decides to go build airplane engines? The Portal of the Folded Wings is a monument to early aviation pioneers and Charlie is buried there. He's not remembered as well as maybe some of the other people who are there at the Portal of the Folded Wings, but hopefully we can change that in the future. <laughs>